Dr. Angela Petal is joining us from the Toronto area today. Um, she did a residency in vision therapy and rehabilitation. Um, she is in private practice, as I mentioned, in the greater Toronto area. And she's also a past president of Vision Therapy Canada. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to her. Great. Thanks, Colin. Nice to see you. I know this is a crazy time right now. So this actually is a silver lining of COVID. We get to get people across the world helping each other out. So you know what, I always look for the silver linings in everything. Um, so I have condensed this lecture. I have this lecture online actually on my website. For, it's about an hour long, but I've condensed it to maybe be about 20 minutes. Please, please, please just interrupt me. To be honest, I like to feel the audience. I like to go back and forth. Um, and if you want me to reiterate something too, just say, can you clarify that? But I'll just keep jabbering until you stop me basically. <laughs> so um, with school starting or starting in a few weeks here in Toronto, I think this is like a perfect time to talk about important visual skills that our children need for uh, going back to school and for adequate learning. Um, let me see if I can switch this slide. There we go. So some of the goals, we'll talk about really infancy and toddler development because a lot of our early visual skills um, take place, development takes place during that time. So we'll delve quickly then into the visual skills needed for classroom learning, as well as the processing or visual perceptual skills needed from when we go from learning to read to reading to learn. That's where our visual processing skills really need to take it up a notch. Um, I'll give you a few handouts, or handouts, I'm not going to hand anything to you. I'm gonna, I'll show you some visual, some signs of visual problems that you can pick up in your children or if you're a teacher uh, and your students. And then we can go into specifics of vision relating learning disorders and talk about why a vision therapy evaluation might differ from a routine eye exam and why you may need one if your routine eye exam comes back normal and you still have that parent gut feeling that something's not right. Uh, so I'm going to delve right in. This is a great quote. I'm going to start and end the lecture with it because I think it'll really ring home by the end of it. But this is Dr. John Streff and he says it beautifully. He says, when vision is working well, it guides and leads in all that we do. When not, it interferes. And boy, does it interfere because vision is our dominant sense. You can imagine if there's a problem with blurry vision or double vision um, or interpreting vision, that that's really going to interfere with your development and your perspective on the world. Um, a few stats in case I have some people who like numbers out there, but 90% of school activities are visual in nature. I have no idea what the stat is. If we're doing online learning all day in our classroom coming up this year, higher than that, I guess. Um, vision disorders are the fourth most common disability among children in North America. And even two to 5% of neurotypical preschool children have impaired vision. That's a chunk of, ch of children without any other delays having impaired vision. Uh, and the most common visual problems are not associated with 2020 eyesight. In, in fact, that's just one of 17 visual skills that we really need for learning. So if that's the ticket that your school nurse did a screening and said she, the child is 2020, you want to delve a little bit deeper if there's some things awry with learning or with school. Um, more information is processed through the eye than all of the rest of the body at any given moment. So vision is our fastest method of processing information. Yes, you've probably heard of I'm a visual learner, I'm an auditory learner, for sure. That's great, but if vision is the fastest mode, the light, speed of light is faster than the speed of sound, let's make sure we maximize what we can get. Of course, auditory processing is important, but vision processing is very important, especially when you're going into college and university in the later years, there's only so much you can listen. A lot of this information needs to be retained visually as well. Um, and, and this is important in our brain injury population, over 85% of our brain has visual connections. So if I have a whiplash or a concussion or if I have a neurodevelopmental disease, 85% of the brain has connections to vision. So, you know, whether I whiplash this in a car accident or I have some torsion in the brainstem, you better believe vision is going to be affected. Um, and vision, the visual system is five times larger than the entire auditory system. In fact, the auditory system doesn't have a cortex in the visual, visual obviously vision has a visual cortex, occipital lobe. So let's go a little bit back into infancy and talk about vision development. It's important if you take anything from this lecture is that vision can be developed throughout life. Yes, we might have missed a step, but we can rehabilitate or develop that skill later in life. But there is some critical 
times in infancy and taught in, in when you're a toddler, that vision is really flourishing and developing. So vision, uh, children learn visual skills from their interactions with their environment. If they are on their back all day and no stimulation, their experience visually is going to be a lot different than a child who is allowed to roll around the floor and has colors and lights and stimulation um, in their environment when they're growing up. A uh, pediatrician, Dr. Gazelle, said way back when, 1949, a beautiful quote that's really profound right now, and it, or always, but really with what we're doing in rehabilitation. He said that vision is profoundly integrated with the development of the total action system of the child, including posture, coordination, motor skills, and even personality and intelligence. Now, you might say that sounds like a stretch, but to me, if somebody is nearsighted and shy and lives within 20 centimeters, that's going to affect how they are perceived and how their personality is perceived from somebody else. They're going to be perceived differently with their peers. They're not going to have, be as comfortable as somebody who might be, let's say, really farsighted and prefers to project outward. And personality and how we project someone's personality can also therefore affect confidence or frustration or self-esteem and all of that plays into intelligence. So, you know, there's a few things that might seem like a stretch here, but vision really is profoundly integrated with our development. Uh, let's go back a little bit as well and talk about perception even in utero. So to perceive, just to perceive, not sight 2020, but to perceive and visually perceive, a child, a child must be able to discern differences. That's what vision is, I'm perceiving a difference. Fixation, so looking at an object is the first discrimination task. We are, when you're about, well born, followed by gaze fixation at four to six months. In an infant, when a newborn, their central vision isn't developed. So this is all peripheral vision. And in fact, you'll see later that peripheral vision plays a key role in learning and development. Uh, but that's the first discrimination task. So ma baby looking to mom uh, with when the, their eyes are first open. That's discrimination, determining hairline from eyebrows to eyes. That's about as blurry as it's going to get. Um, and then you see the movement from around three months to six months when they're starting to coordinate motor and vision. Uh, if you've heard of reflexes or baby reflexes, primitive reflexes we call them, these are reflexive survival uh, mechanisms that help your child learn to move through space and, and develop these reflexes to eventually walk and talk and run away. Uh, but one of the ones that's really important with visual development is called the ATNR, the asymmetric tonic neck reflex. So if you have your baby three months, he's on his back and he's moving around and he accidentally hits something with one arm. I don't know, you, maybe you have him in an arc and he hit, hits a bell. So there's a reflex that says, oh, my hand touched something. My eye should look at that. And the reflexes causes outstretching of one side and you'll see a bit of a flexion on the other side. And that's called the asymmetric, because one side is in, one side is out, like this, uh, tonic neck reflex. That's the first eye-hand coordination reflex that happens around three and integrates maybe around nine to 10 months of age. It's actually a first sign of, of visual motor integration or eye-hand coordination, I like to call it. All these little check boxes that you can sort of see if you're new parents out there, if they're meeting some milestones. Uh, interestingly enough, well, we know that vision has a motor basis, but the interesting part of this is that fetuses' eyes will move under fused lids. So in utero up to about six, seven, eight months, the child's uh, eyes are fused, but their eyes under their fused lids are moving in response to the mother's movement in utero. So the stimulation of their vestibular system, which is actually developed before vision, causes their eyes to, to reactively move when mom moves. So here we go back into, is mom moving a lot? Can she dance in the kitchen? Is she swimming? Is she out moving around? Because her movement is then improving the child's eye movement and eye tracking, which then develops those ATNR and those primitive reflexes more strongly when they, become, when they come out. I know if you have to be bedridden, you still move around. But let's just say, okay, we have twins and we have to be bedridden. Well, why don't we at least get some movement going early when the baby is born to really promote that reflex to happen? Like I said earlier, if we skip a step, fine, let's just make sure that we know that we can always go back and rehabilitate it. So movement is key actually throughout this whole lecture, you'll see. The next thing that I find really interesting is, called, is gaze tracking and how we can we can almost crystal ball 
language development and tracking development when babies are between six months to 18 months. So recent research is showing that babies who are better at following a parent's eye gaze. So this is my little guy here. I think this one's Leo. <laughs> this is Leo. And if, if he's looking at me and then someone walks in the door and I look at the door and look surprised. So I have a surprise visitor. If at six months he follows my gaze and looks at the door, he's going to have a much more dramatically high vocabulary at 18 or 20 to 24 months than someone who does not follow my eye gaze. So active gaze following at 12 months, when you test them again at 18 months, they have 335 words known. That's receptive language. Not that at 12, 18 months he knows to say 335 words, it's receptive language. Babies who do not follow mom or dad or guardian's active gaze at 12 months only have 195 words known by 18 months. That's dramatic difference. And that is all followed by eye patterning and eye gaze tracking. So how does that move on to later? Well, this is language develop I'm talking about. Um, but how does this lead into vision? Well, language learning assists obviously in learning the names of things, i.e. following the line of regard of a speaker but also learning about emotions. So let's say Leo looked over and I saw someone come in the door and I was surprised and I was happy, then he's learning about what makes joy, what makes fear. If he saw me, maybe a spider dangle by and I start to cry, he might not understand fear of spiders. And so it can clarify emotions about line of regard and really be able to empathize with people but also imitative learning. So human acts are also visually guided and a child can hone in on these goals and intentions by following the gaze. So you can understand human interaction by imitative learning and that starts as early as six months. So they are much more aware of our body language. They follow our eye gaze at six months, um, which is, it was a wow moment when I read this research for me. So as we alluded, vision and motor work together and should develop together. Those random movements I was talking about when the baby is on his back swinging ATNR, those accidentally provide beginnings of voluntary motor control. That's why early stimulation is important. We want them to have these accidental findings and learn, you know, oh, you put a, a balloon attached to his foot and he moves his foot and the balloon moves, that motor reaction that you want him to figure out. So all voluntary motor movements, so ones that they do on their own, then stem from that learning, that self-awareness that they made. So this awareness slowly develops a mental map of their body, where they are, where's my right, where's my left, where's up, where's down, where, where's the coffee table, where's the chair behind me, mental map of space and of person. Uh, and this is imperative for development of coordination. Do they know rights and lefts? Do, can they go up the stairs like this by three, three and a half? Uh, can they crawl properly? All of this stuff is, is vision leading motor. Um, movement here gives a feedback to the visual system on how to judge and interpret visual space. And this is key. So once they see, they move, they get, and they understand volume of space. How can I judge how Elliot here can get that basketball into the that pool net? How did he judge that? Uh, that is vision and volume of space and practice with the proper volume of space ideas. Uh, so there's no substitute for movement. Now, I might have an adage to that as I learn and grow because visualization has been shown without the movement to enhance athlete skills. But that's something they've done before and are practicing it in their mind, which is an incredible thing with visualization and is often what we do in BT and athletes do it too. <laughs> um, but key here is what has taken the place of all of this vital developmental play? These pictures are not my children for the record. <laughs> uh, well, that, the one with the bait, I don't know, they, they all just disgust me. But cell phones, tablets, TVs, computers. And let me tell you, my kids are on online learning too. It's not that I'm against tablets, but I think at this age here, this is, is before two, they shouldn't see a screen. Make it a fake one, like a remote control or something. Uh, because the key to learning visually is the movement. And with the screens, that's a 2D world, and they know that they're living in a 3D world. So let's take a step back and say, what is vision? What am I talking about here? So of course, good vision does require good sight, but it requires so much more than the 20-20 visual acuity that you get typically from an eye screening and even a comprehensive eye exam. The kids, or all of us, need to need the ability to gather and interpret the visual information. 
So if you've seen this before, I don't know how many people are here, but if you've seen this before, it is something that maybe a two-year-old could identify. Uh, you don't necessarily need excellent 2020 vision, you need good vision to see it. Um, but oftentimes I show this slide and I get the funniest answers. Oh, this is an aerial view of an island. This is, you know, an ink splotch from a psychological test. Like I get all this funny stuff. But here, can you see my, my pointer? So this here is a cow. So that's his ear. That's his long snout. His other ear, an eye, an eye, snout. And he's sort of looking on like his back like that. Once you see it, then it's like, oh, of course, that's a cow. Of course, this is a cow. I knew a cow since I was two. But beforehand, you didn't know it. Does that mean you didn't have good vision before? No, you had good vision before. But what happened when you're like, oh, yes, that's a cow, that's when vision happened. You've made a meaningful interpretation of something. You've linked cow to whatever cow files you have in your brain. And now you can't unsee this. So if I take it away and I put it back, you saw the cow instantly. So you made a new neuronal collection. That's neuroplasticity in action right here. You've made an interpretation. So if you can't interpret, and I show Billy this, and then I move on to the next slide, he didn't make the learning from that, and that's where the vision piece is an issue. This is visual processing, but also meaningful vision at its best. Okay, so I sort of belabored this, but visual acuity testing is the ability to see at 2020. Even if a child passes this test, it doesn't mean that they don't need glasses or don't have any other visual conditions. We need to dig a little bit deeper. So let's talk about the two visual processing pathways that are important for good vision. There's the ventral stream and the dorsal stream. How a vision goes from eyes to different parts of our brain. So the ventral stream is our what is that um, stream recognition. So without going into too much neurology, it goes into the thalamus to the visual cortex to the temporal lobe for object recognition. What is that? That's a coffee cup. The dorsal stream is more, where is that? So I know it's a coffee cup, but how do I know how far it is from me? So that's, that projects the dorsal areas of visual cortex to the parietal lobe for object localization. So those two lobe, those two processes happen simultaneously. So I can say, what is it? It's coffee cup, where is it? One inch from me, so maybe more. Uh, here's a sort of an idea in the brain here where it goes. So if you start at the back where it says occipital lobe here, so from the eyes, which would be here, you can take a pit stop in the thalamus and a lot of our, our neur neurons go to the occipital lobe. Upwards here to the parietal is our dorsal stream, where is it? And over here to the temporal lobe, it's what is it? And it should happen at the same time. What does this have to do with anything? Well, they did a study on dorsal stream versus ventral stream and readers. So impaired motion perception, which is the dorsal stream, in a lab setting are correlated with a reduced reading rate in children. Now you're thinking reading, that should be ventral. That's what is it, what is that word? But it's so motor. Impaired motion perception has also been linked to social and nonverbal communication problems. So if I don't know where something is and I'm on a busy playground and kids are whizzing by me, do you wanna play this? Can you hopscotch? And you can't perceive good biological motion and perceive volume of space, then that's gonna impair your social abilities as you develop through life. So I'm going to take a step back here and how do we see? How do we see to read? How do we see to copy from the board? So one of the first fixations, first skills that we learn when we're a baby is fixation. And that's just aiming and pointing. One of the easiest tests I do on my six plus population in my exam chair is I give them a sticker and I say, look at this. Don't take your eyes off it. Look at this. That's all I say. I say, I'm going to time you for 10 seconds. And if there's a problem, if they can't hold their gaze on this sticker for 10 seconds, then I know they can't even get to the next stage, which is tracking and fixating, which is reading. So the first thing we gotta do is can you aim your eyes? Then the next thing is ocular motor. So can you aim and move them at the same time? All while this is happening, they have to be able to focus the word. So the camera has to be able to focus in. And of course the eyes have to work together. So they also have to convert. Just so much stuff that goes on with reading that we take for granted. But like that quote in the beginning, if it's helping, you're, you're flourish. If not, it really does interfere. So these skills all together determine speed, accuracy, endurance of gathering visual information. After that, we just got the information in the eyes. Now the brain has to process what it's seen. So visual information processing, or your optometrist might say visual information processing. Uh, this is the process by which the brain interprets visual information received by the eyes. If the eyes got it incorrectly, 
I won't even bother testing visual pre perceptual skills if the if I know that it's blurry, it's not tracked properly, it's double. Like who knows what the brain's going to interpret with that? But if it got in beautifully and there's still an issue, then I delve into perception. Um, I like this little analogy here. The, ch the child will spend so much energy just looking at and trying to track. There's little mental energy at the end to decode what they just did. So they're just so proud of themselves that they got past the paragraph. Half of it was only double or it was half clear. And at the end, you say, we're going to ask you 10 questions on that paragraph. What a confidence killer. So that's perception. If you can get it in, but you used all your mental energy to do that, you don't have any battery reserves left for the questions at the end. We, there are a lot of perceptual skills you can address that I could go on for days, so I will really just sit and list them. But visual discrimination is the ability to find differences in likeness between words and colors and objects. Visual memory, there's two types of visual memory. One is the simultaneous. I can take a picture, a photographic memory, and, and remember what it is and recall it. And one of them in the temporal lobe is called sequential memory. So recalling sequences, long spelling words, or when we used to have to memorize phone numbers, all that sequential memory. Two different parts of the brain, two different types of visual memory. Uh, spatial relations, the ability to distinguish what is different among similar objects that are the same, and also being able to manipulate and maneuver things in your mind. Really good for math, even location of your seat in the classroom or book in the library shelf. Um, sequence of letters in a word. You might see they spell the word, but they put H and I in the wrong side. So that can be a spatial relations difficulty. Form constancy, we see this a lot and it's a very normal mistake to make until about seven or eight when they reverse letters and numbers. It's if it persists that it's the issue. Um, form constancy is the ability to manipulate forms and predict the result. So I like this little picture of the chair and the BDPQ because when you're learning and you're little, you say, this is a chair, Billy. You could turn the chair and he'll still know it's a chair. You could turn the chair upside down and he'd still say that's a chair. You could turn it the other way and he'd still say that's a chair. And then you put him in front of a letter B and a D and you say, no, these are totally different. And so you're, he, you're asking a huge leap of faith on this because everything else in the world, the form is constant if I turn it on its head. But then in the English language, B's and D's and P's and Q's, and you could reverse anything, are totally different meaning. So this is where the laterality, so the lefts and the rights and the having the good mental space is key. And we learn that so young. Figure ground is another important visual skill. Um, that's like your Where's Waldo? Hidden pictures, can you find what you need in a busy background? Can you find the soup can in the grocery store? Can you find your eraser on your messy desk? Uh, visual closure, so we show them an incomplete picture. And we say, can you fill that in your mind? What's that gonna turn out to be? That's really good for reading, and uh, fast reading in particular. Good readers actually have good gestalts. They look at the form of the word, they fill it in, in their mind and they move forward. That's high level reading, but really good readers have great visual closure. Uh, we chatted about this one. This is a lefts and rights, directionality, laterality. Can they important for orientation of letters and knowing how uh, to move through space? I'm talking too much, Kalen. Are we good for time? <laughs> okay. Signs of a visual problem and learning related disorder. So this is probably the stuff that will be take home for parents. Um, reduced coordination. So if you if you throw a soft ball at your child and they close their eyes they know it's coming as i johnny i'm gonna throw a ball at you they close their eyes and outstretch their arms it hits them in the chest or their face and then they reflexively do this vision is not useful she knows it's coming but it's not useful because she can't track how fast it's coming and the volume of space that's reducing over time um, and you'll see that in children that are clumsy i mean at a certain age that's how they learn but once once you know you've always heard keep your eye on the ball literally if they could follow that appropriately then they would be able to catch it vision leads motor so these are the children that tend to be clumsy or they prefer solo sports they're really athletic and they like moving their body but they'll always choose skiing or swimming or dancing or gymnastics over baseball or basketball yes they're telling me their vision isn't useful when you really need depth perception um, also, you might see some compensations. So if they're still reading with their fingers after second grade, they cover an eye or they do something funny like this when they're reading, they're compensating for a visual deficit. They hold their books really far or really close. They're find, trying to find the sweet spot that makes life a little bit easier. 
or you might, this is a personality thing. So you might have a kid that compensates. I'm going to do well, no matter what, I'm going to put my finger on the text and I'm going to read it. I'm going to get a headache, but it'll be worth the headache type A personality. Or you might have type B personality. Forget this. I'm going to look out the window. I'm going to cause havoc because I'm going to get attention, whether it's negative or positive. So this could be the exact same visual deficit and the personality here took over. Uh, signs of eye focusing problems really are physical. So mom and dad usually come in and say, Billy's got red eyes by the end of the day. Billy rubs his eyes. Um, he complains he can't see after reading for a little bit. Or he starts off really well and by the end of the paragraph, he's, he's got ants in his pants. We can't keep him seated at the table anymore. So that can be indicative of eye focusing problem. Headaches too, this stuff gets really physical. Uh, signs of a poor eye tracking uh, or eye tracking deficit is well using your finger, a lot of loss of place or rereading, skipping small words is a big one, uh, rereading whole lines, difficulty tracking a ball coming at them or how fast that car is coming when they're crossing the street. That's deficits of pursuits, which are smooth eye movements, and saccades, which are those important small jumpy ones we do from word to word when we're reading. And signs of symptoms of the perceptual skills that I alluded to earlier, a big one for, my, for parents when they come in to, to see me is that I'll teach them, they'll say, I teach Johnny a new word, and then two sentences later, he doesn't remember it. Like we just showed you, this is the word umbrella. How come you don't remember it within 30 seconds? That's visual memory, that's, that's a perceptual issue. Poor reading comprehension. So they're reading fine, but then asking them the questions at the end is difficult. Uh, Reversals that are sticking around past the first, second grade would be a perceptual issue, as well as poor handwriting. So fine motor control in the fingertips is similar to the small movements that we need to make in our eyes. So oftentimes I see hand in hand tracking and handwriting changes. Symptoms that you might see, self-esteem issues, so confidence issues, frustration, temper flare-ups, short attention span, irritability, when you wanna sit down and read. So they could sit and play their switch for two hours, but for them to read a paragraph for 20 minutes, all of a sudden they become a little devil child. You're like, what's the difference? The difference is they're having difficulty processing their vision in a demanding way. Um, and oftentimes parents have no idea. They've had eyes checked, the eyes look straight, they look healthy. Johnny can see an airplane in the sky and a Cheerio on the ground. They've got eagle eyes. Um, they think that everyone sees the way they do, but Johnny's parents didn't know that he's seeing double half the time he looks up close because it's hard for him to report as a five-year-old that this is how he sees. So I often get parents saying, he never told me he saw double. Like he's four, that this is the world to him right now. So uh, make sure uh, we ask great questions in the exam room as a developmental optometrist, but it's always an enlightening moment for mom and dad when they realize that they, their child is seeing double or blurry. So that alludes into what type of evaluation we're doing uh, here when we do a vision therapy evaluation. And I should say, I say vision therapy evaluation, but the answer is not always vision therapy. Sometimes it really is compensating low magnifying glasses to help with their focusing. Sometimes it's prisms to change space and change the world. Sometimes it's light therapy. And sometimes it's actual in-office vision therapy, which is akin to sort of occupational therapy for the brain-eye connection. Um, I like to use this little pyramid here. I've changed it over the years, but this slide keeps sticking. At the bottom of the pyramid, so we build things from the ground up, is ocular health. Does everything look beautiful? Is their cornea clear? Is the retina perfect? Is the optic nerve a great size? All the good stuff that a regular eye exam will definitely check. Next, next we do a visual acuity. Can they see well? Do they have a minus eight myopic or nearsighted prescription? Uh, can they move their eyes? Not fine motor tracking, but can they move their eyes in all gazes? Is there a paresis or a palsy? And that tends to cover a routine eye exam. The three top parts of that pyramid is the next level. So it tends to be, we call it a neurodevelopmental exam. So binocularity and accommodation means can they team their eyes together and can they focus their eyes together to read? Ocular motor control means can they fixate on something and then move and track without losing their spot. And then the top of the pyramid, as I alluded to earlier, is processing. So if all of those steps are strong and can hold and support easily uh, the demands of reading, then can they process and understand what they're reading? And that's exactly how we would go through a therapy program as well. We'd start from the ground up and then work with the higher order perception at the end. So how can optometrists help? Why optometrists? Why not somebody else? So developmental optometrists diagnose, we manage, we treat binocular vision and those perceptual problems. 
the big thing here is that I do realize that there is learning issues and reading issues that do not have to do with vision. Developmental optometrists can help a child overcome the vision problems that's interfering with the ability to read. Once this is accomplished, if there was something outstanding, the child then is more capable of responding to special education efforts aimed at treating the reading problem itself. So we're all entitled to more than one problem. So if there happens to be a visual issue overlaying a reading one, then let's solve that. Let's give the child everything we can. And then the great special education efforts from whatever team, SLP, OT, special ed teachers can be more effective at their job. So it's all about collaboration. With that said, without, it, without the appropriate treatment for these visual dysfunctions, we are ignoring 25% of our pediatric population, especially because they're not going to report that I see a little bit blurry or double, unless they're really verbal and a bit older. So the treatment. So there's something that we are typically seeing, <laughs> the corrective lenses. So you're nearsighted, you're farsighted. This is the typical glasses you'd wear. This is my child looking like Harry Potter. Um, reading glasses can help support eye focusing issues. Or I also do low therapeutic lenses if a child's gonna be on a screen for a long time. That's a lot of holding focus for now, probably multiple hours a day. So I give them a little bit of work, work in the glasses so that they don't have to work so hard to see. Um, and there's also performance lenses I alluded to uh, called prism lenses. Prisms, all they do optically is shift space. They can shift space up, they can shift space to the right, to the left. But when you shift, particularly when you shift space up, you activate your side vision, which is your grounding, your peripheral vision. And if we get visually stressed, we tunnel our vision, adults and kids alike. And then it's like trying to read through some straws. If I can enhance their span of their vision and help them track, that's what I'm gonna do in a pair of glasses. So I consider them like training wheels. So I put prisms in glasses quite often to help tracking and reading. So what is vision therapy? So it's a case specific program of vision procedures performed under doctor supervision and it helps remedy like OT, the deficiencies I outlined before. So you can improve fundamental skills. We can go back and say, hey, you missed this crawling stage. Did you know that crawling and vision really develop around the same time, six to eight months to 18 months, we're learning to crawl and move and eventually walk and run. But that's the key time when we're learning to focus our eyes and converge our eyes. And if you're getting the movement of crawling, which is so important, you're also getting really good feedback for the visual system. So oftentimes I'm testing my children in here, they're crawling for me, they're doing jumping jacks, they're doing angels in the snow. So I can see, did they meet those motor milestones that are so important for the vision test that I'm doing. Um, so back to this. So vision therapy also changes how a patient can process or interpret visual information. So we can enhance the sequential memory. We can enhance the photographic memory. And even if you did not do vision therapy and say you did a visual perceptual evaluation and I said, you know what, Sally really has great sequential visual memory. She can remember in sequences, 90th percentile, but her photographic memory was fifth percentile. How about you stop doing flashcards? Because that's trying to activate just that photographic memory. And if you really want her to learn, of course we can work on this, but her strength is over here. Show things in sequence to her. So little things that can help a teacher really reach the child. Say, look, this is 90th percentile, this is outstanding. Why don't we use this amazing skill so that she can reach up to her peers? So even if we don't do a vision therapy evaluation, it's a really good idea of how we can help the child otherwise. So everybody can learn, we just have to figure out how to teach them. So vision therapy really is neuroplasticity in action. So we know now, and I feel like I used to have to lecture more on this, but we know the brain changes over our lifetime until our last breath. It's not that there's just a critical period and once you're eight or nine, your brain can't change anymore. I could learn a new language tomorrow. I can learn to salsa dance tomorrow. Uh, we're all neuroplastic. Um, but it's, neuroplasticity is the term to describe a sequence of events or processes that take place in your brain in response to incoming stimuli, negative or positive. So your emotions, your behaviors, experience, and thoughts physically changes the way your brain functions. Positive thoughts, positive emotions, negative thoughts equals negative emotions. So you can physically change your behavior by your thoughts. Now neuroplasticity and vision therapy is similar. It involves perceptual and motor learning, making new pathways to make a more succinct tracking, focusing, whatever we're trying to do. Um, neural reprogramming and long-term potentiation. That's, those are big words, but all it means is that proper repetition, proper feedback for the patient, reinforcing those new skills, and then making them self-aware. That's technically how you can learn anything.
repetition, feedback, reinforcement, self-awareness. In our vision therapy team, I've narrowed it down to a much more easy, easy equation. Novelty, so a new skill, plus fun, because they're not engaged and they're not aware, they're not going to learn, equals learning. So the more engaging and the more novel the activity, that equals the new learning. This is why if you have somebody that says, just practice reading more, then you will figure it out. No, we have to teach that skill in a novel way, make a new neural pathway, add some excitement to it, and then go back to the reading. More reading practice doesn't equal better tracking skills. So who would benefit then from vision therapy if I just said that we were neuroplastic until our last breath? Well, anyone with visual perceptual learning related cases, binocular vision, so kids with blurry vision, eye strain, double vision, but also our concussion and our acquired brain injury population. Those are the patients that uh, are suffering with headaches and they can't read, but they used to know how to read. Uh, and that's where we really need to make new, strengthen those neural connections. And of course, even if you're an amazing eye tracker, eye focuser, peripheral awareness, we also do sports enhancement too, because yes, you're the best, but can you be 1% better? And that's what a vision therapy program for sports enhancement would do. So to summarize here, if you take anything from this lecture, vision is learned and can develop through life and we can change vision patterns um, positively at any stage in life. Vision leads our motor. So get the kids moving, get them out in space and get volume of space. When they're really little, I see and I reach and then I get and they learn those spatial maps. And very important visual skills that you should ask your optometrist if they're checking is eye tracking, eye teaming, eye focusing. Those are the three big ones. And if all is well, visual perceptual skills. So if your child's struggling, and it might be why you're here today, um, vision is definitely one area to consider. It's not the only cause of learning problems, but if it's not working well, it needs to be addressed. We have a wonderful team here. We have an OT here. We have a natural path. We also refer out to speech and language, physiotherapy, all of these osteopathy, all of these wonderful things help for the total action system of the child, the total collaboration. So if address the vision, but if there's anything else as well, optometrists tend to be really good with collaboration and collaborative care. Okay, I'm going to end, sorry, Kalin, <laughs> with the quote, I hope it means more now. When vision is working well, it guides and leads in all that we do. When not, it interferes. So I'm happy to stay for questions. I'm assuming there might be a few. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that presentation. Um, and yes, a few questions did come in through that. So we'll hop right on those. Um, okay, so during the section, you were talking about prisms. Mm. I had a question. Are prisms used for other reasons aside from reading, specifically asking for children with poor depth perception mm. and clumsiness? Yes. Yeah. So I, I did at the time talk about reading. So I tend to put base down prism, which shifts space up and out and helps expand their periphery. Prisms can be prescribed for many different reasons. So sometimes there's compensating prisms. So if you have an eye turn, let's say up, you can put prisms to line that image up with the eye and you can start to get some depth perception. Then what I would do in a therapeutic approach is work on that depth perception with the prisms and then slowly reduce it over time. So you can work on spatial awareness that way. Compensating prisms for eye turns inward and outward tend to not work as well because we, we call this, they eat up the prisms. We see them in six months and they need more. We see them in six months and they need more because you're just putting the image where the eye is. And you're not training the eye to work on its own. But yes, if you do specific prisms, both face up or both face down, you can change volume of space and you can change coordination usually in conjunction, if it's big prisms, in conjunction with a BT program. Okay. And, and follow ask a follow-up to that? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Is there okay, a okay, ask? Go ahead. Okay, that was my question. Um, okay. So my child, he is um, like fine vision in one eye, but 2,400 with mm -hmm. correction in his other. And some other parents have talked about these prisms, and I had never heard it. We've seen an an optometrist and an ophthalmologist who want to do two different treatments and it's been very confusing to me um kind of where what what treatment will work for him best but neither had brought up these prisms so i didn't know if it was something in his specific condition that wouldn't be helped he so, has amblyopia yeah it sounds like it's we call refractive amblyopia so one eye sees better than the other but there's no major eye turn correct right there's no turn you 
Yeah, so prisms, I wouldn't say in this case, but I would say, what city are you in? Buffalo. Oh, okay. Not far from you, but I can't get out. I can't get over there yet. <laughs> We're close. <laughs> no, I was thinking, who do I know in that area? Because if there's, that's pretty dense um, refractive amblyopia or lazy eye, which is a terrible term. What I would do, is there any sort of modified patching, like a, a almost looks like scotch tape patching, we call it bangered or foils that you're doing? Yeah, so we saw Dr. O'Connor out of East Aurora, which is a little south of Buffalo. And he, at the time my child was four, suggested mm -hmm. a contact mm -hmm. and vision therapy. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the weather around here to get him out there twice a week and it was over an hour drive. Yeah. I, whatever I had to do for my child, I would do, but it, to get a contact in his eye was really, it was, it, it was traumatic for him. Yes. <laughs> and the ophthalmologist we were working with said, let's try the patching and glasses. So I was left with two options. I had to do the path of least resistance with my four-year-old. So we, we've been patching for about a, almost a year. And um, his vision went from 2,600 with the lens to 2,400. So it has been improving. Okay. But I want to do everything I can as young as he can. And I'm still considering going back to the vision therapy if that would be helpful to for I think him. it would be drastically helpful. So the regular eye patch, like the pirate eye patch that we that ophthalmologists tend to prescribe, and same with optometrists tend to prescribe, teaches them to use one channel or the other, but not the channels together. So as soon as you take that patch off, it's the path of least resistance, and they'll use that eye that's dominant again. So the patch of a bangard or foil, so on the glasses, it almost looks like scotch tape, so it allows a little bit of light in, will help his eye focus better because if this is the eye that's now seeing but the other eye is not ignored. And so we slowly decrease the density of that patch until they're working together as a team. But the okay, other really I think I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, go ahead. The other really important aspect of that is measuring what his eye is doing when he's reading. So it has your optometrist to see if there's a lag of focusing on that amblyopic eye when he's reading. If there is, and I could put all my money that there is, tell the optometrist to add a bifocal to that one lens. Okay, in his poor, in his worse eye. Mm -hmm, because um, that's I, where the world is. I think I had asked about that type of foil mm -hmm. um, to the ophthalmologist, and he said it because his vision was so poor, he wouldn't recommend that. Because I also asked about the drops that could blur his vision. Mm -hmm. um, you too poor, you're right, for the drops. Yeah, so he, I heard a foil, by the time, if you get some vision therapy and you get him down to 2080, which I think, you know, even if you can't do the VT, if you do the bifocal, get them to 2080. Okay. You can add that foil and you're off to the races. Okay. Great. Yeah. He's just starting kindergarten, maybe in another week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, I'm just trying to do as much pre stuff, you know, he, he, he shows frustration his clumsiness. He, he, he's very tactile. I think he's sensory maybe because of his, vision is poor so his other sense you know senses want to be um are, are greater yeah. and I, i'm tr just trying to do everything i can to make learning okay for him because of his inability to to focus and i mean he falls out of his chair he hits his head on everything because he doesn't have that depth of perception yes. yes but he's a very physical kid too so um anything i can do to kind of help absolutely he's, for him so yeah. Uh, yeah I would put bifocal in the one eye get him to 2080 then start the foil and I mean how, how long do you think it it will take to go from 2400 to 2080 with the bifocal a couple months okay and that's not without the patching or yeah, with without the patching with without without okay yeah oh so even okay. more if it's even easier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're the rewards and everything for the patching. He's kind of starting to understand mm -hmm. behavior and rewards, but um, um, he's not that, reading. He's not reading yet. Right. He's showing really no. He loves to be read too, but he has no interest in reading, and he gives up on letters. I think because it's hard for him. Exactly. So, I, I mean, would the bifocal help even if he's? So that's the goal. That's where it's going to help first. 
And then okay. it'll be less distorted when he's looking. It'll be easier to look with two eyes. And that's what tells the brain, oh, this is easier. And I'm using two eyes together. And that's what gets the vision better and better. It's okay. Like, like is, connect up the two. Is, can I ask a follow, another follow-up <laughs> question? Is it common because he's left eye dominant, he still has yet to pick. I know that his um, dominant hand will be last to, to pick. I notice he like swings. I'm a phys ed teacher, so we're, we're very physical around here. Um, he swings a baseball bat and, and a hockey stick lefty, but he writes with his right hand and eats with his right hand. And I feel like his body is not able to make that connection with his brain on how to do things comfortably and efficiently. Yeah, it's, it things like are getting crossed. Yeah, his bilaterality and and all and I do so many things to try to help, but mm -hmm. you know it could just be his personality. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg, either. But Did he crawl when he was little. Was it a good? Yeah, crawl? he he crawled. He was very physical. He walked, you know, right before he was one. But mm -hmm. he, and he crawled a lot. You know, maybe around six, seven months he started. So he had all that, but he but was a very colicky baby and mm -hmm. he's very um I don't know if his if it's his personality to be more frustrated and get really upset or if because the world is harder for him wait, he wait. gets frustrated easier I'm yeah. I put starting my that. okay yeah yeah look into primitive reflexes because that's going to help him integrate rights and lefts and ups and downs yeah he receives OT right now and I am hoping and now that he's entering into kindergarten, getting school-based services, yeah. I'm hoping that, um, I don't want to say it's, it'll be better, but they'll Listen, know more about this right stuff. Things. Yeah. He's doing all the right things. The primitive reflexes along with helping the eyes work as a team will allow him to move that egocentric location just in front of one eye that's seeing to the center, our third eye almost, <laughs> to the center. So that's when you can perceive space and incorporate right and left together. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing all the right things. But if your optometrist wants to email me, I'm sure you can find me, he or she. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And you have a follow-up question here, um, Dr. Petal, from a colleague. What tests do you use to assess spatial relations? Oh, so I use the fourth edition of the TVPS. So that has all seven of those um, skills that I outlined from visual memory, spatial relations, visual discrimination. It's all in that TVPS, Test of Visual Perceptual Skills. Okay. And then another question, you mentioned at the beginning that you have a full presentation version on your website. Mm -hmm. So people wanted me to share that in the chat, if you don't mind. Yes, Elite Vision Center, R-E, because we're Canadian, dot com. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. And okay, another one here. Do all children who suffer from lazy eye amblyopia have learning difficulties? You know, that's, this one hits home because when I was in my residency, I don't know, 13, 10, I don't know, 13 years ago, <laughs> 12 years ago, uh, I had a professor who asked me that question. And I said, well, probably, probably, because if you're interpreting space differently, uh, you might not know, you might perform well, but you could be an A plus performer and just not know it. And you're a B and thinking you're doing well. Uh, that professor said, no, you're using one eye. It's easy. If you can physically suppress the whole time, it's easy and you don't have to worry about double vision or eye focusing. And I really sat on that and did not feel good about it because how much, eff how much effort A for the brain to suppress is happening? How much battery power are you taking? But then you're missing out on the volume of space world. So with, with amblyopia, you lose, you can lose depth perception and perceptual space. So even if it, it's like my sports enhancement, even if it looks like they're performing really well, who's to say how much farther they can go or how much effort they're putting in when I could take that effort away. So I would probably put like, I mean, there's no full evidence medicine study to say A or nay, but I will put my money on that they're struggling in some way and compensating. Okay. Um, do you have any easy resources to share with teachers that aren't overwhelming? Mm -hmm. I know teachers are busy and probably won't read an entire book. <laughs> Maybe they should watch this. <laughs> the um, COVD website has a lot of really great resources. OEP.org also has some good research and they're just like one or two page uh, white paper research. And Vision Therapy Canada has a whole research um, and Q&A section on it as well. 
So that's COVD, OEP, and Vision Therapy Canada. And Colleen, I'm sure you can think of a few others for in terms of like white papers and research. Um, but yeah, YouTube channels, like what you're doing with the iHeartVT, I think will be really helpful because people like to just watch a few clips and sort of get an idea for it. Yeah, I think those are, those are some good resources there for sure. Okay, um, it's hard not to compare your child to other children of their age to want to be sure you're getting them started in school at the right time, not letting them get behind, that they're learning at the right pace. But what is the right pace or the right time to start children on schoolwork type activities? My daughter loves looking at books and she loves being read to, but I also don't want to push her into lots of near work too early. What do you suggest? So this is really individual and there's actually been some battles online is, you know, are some schools starting them too early and ha causing frustration and confidence levels when they're physically not ready for the motor skills demanding in handwriting and reading. So this would really be, I would go on my you know, vision development milestones. Did they crawl and walk on time? Can they kick a ball? Can they go up the stairs? Um, how's their pencil grip? It's okay to start like this and move to this, but eventually should be a tripod grip. So I would make sure all the fine motor and visual motor skills are there before you sit sadly down and say, okay, now we have to learn our letters. But you can learn the, the physical letters and the words also without sitting down and putting their nose in a book. Uh, you could get foam letters for the bathtub. You could get magnet letters for the fridge or the stove. And so you can put, you can put learning into a more playful approach. So that if, they're, they're, if say they were motor delayed, they're still getting the learnings of letter recognition and small word recognition without the fine detail. But, you know, I'd say age five, age six, they should be able to sit down and be able to write their name, write a sentence, read small words or more by six. But um, I wouldn't push them earlier uh, if they're meeting all their mi milestones. Okay. Um, and one other we have here. How can you tell if an ADHD diagnosis is accurate or if it's a vision problem instead? Well, I can't tell if ADHD is accurate, but I could tell if there's also a vision problem. So I would do the visual perceptual workup. I would do the binocular vision workup. And if I saw signs that led to me thinking, hmm, this might be just a problem with converging your eyes, all the symptoms of ants in your pants and looking out the window could also be related to this. So let's solve this and then see, like an onion, peel it back, let's see what's remaining at the end. Never do I say, you know, I'm gonna solve your ADHD, but the symptoms really do mimic the two, but it would have to have some really good visual signs for me to be very confident and say, yeah, we're gonna address the vision because A, this will make life easier anyway, but at the end of it, you might have a different child. Okay. All right, and um, Sarah is asking some questions here about um, computer programs advertised um, as vision therapy um, she said called Amblyopia. I'm wondering, it might be Amblyoplay. I know there are many out there. Do you have thoughts about those? So there's a few programs out there that, especially Amblyoplay, that the theory behind Amblyopia, and this might help you, my gosh, I forgot your name, Sarah? Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. <laughs> so it might help you as well. There's, so there's probably the difference, the, with refractive amblyopia, like your son, the, the, the amblyopic eye not only has poor sight because of the prescription, also has poor contrast sensitivity, slower eye speed processing, slower focusing, which is why I need the bifocal, uh, poor tracking. And so those, those games on the computer are aimed at decreasing the difference of the contrast sensitivity between the right and the left eye. Some of the activities have a role. So we have some computer programs here that we use for five minutes within our vision therapy sessions. And they'll, they'll peel a layer back. So they, that's the beauty of the computers is that they, you can show virtual reality, you can really show depth, you can change contrast and help them see which eye is doing when. But I think as a standalone, you need some more support because the vision leads motor and motor is what's gonna get them really linked together. But it, there's nothing wrong with amblyoplay. I think the theory, is, the research is actually great. It just needs to be in conjunction with a motor program so that you're really taking those skills from the computer and moving them to real life but it's a really good start and computers are really wonderful at being able to make virtual reality and making other things. Okay. All right. Well, we're almost to the end of our time here, but I do have, have one question that I think is particularly pertinent uh, during this um, chaotic back to school time that we're facing. Um, 
as far as the additional screen time that many children are now having due to online learning and things like that, what, what protections or basic visual hygiene recommendations do you have now that we are facing this situation? Yes, and this hits home for me too because of all the online learning at home that's happening right now. Um, well, between two and five, the guidelines, and this is pre-COVID guidelines, but it's still guidelines, is one hour of screen time a day. No, this is virtually impossible now. We have to have our kids learning, I mean, ideally, proper homeschooling, but <laughs> we all work. Um, so we really need to be preventative and protective. So there's two things that come to mind. If your child is focusing on a screen within arm's length for multiple hours a day, I like to add a low plus or low magnifying lens to them just as a buffer. So they don't have to focus that extra few diopters and all that extra energy can go for comfort and comprehension. The other thing I tend to put on there is a blue light blocker. Uh, the research is out to say blue light is so harmful it's going to cause cataracts and macular degeneration that comes from a screen but what i know and what blue light does is it affects our sleep cycles so if you're in front of blue light blue light comes from the sun that's where if we are young and we're out in the sun with those sunglasses eventually we get early cataracts and that's the major source of blue light but when the sun goes down we're no longer seeing blue light and our circadian rhythm switches on and says it's bedtime if we're on a screen and then have our school day and then it's like oh, i need to relax but i want to look at my tablet or play on the switch all of that blue light can affect sleep and if it's not a good sleep then there's not a good consolidation of memory um, of what you've learned throughout the day and so you're going to be worse off the next day so i would do two things i would add a blue blocker coating and I would probably add a little bit of a buffer of a magnifying reading glass set for the computer just to reduce the strain um, on the screen. That's what I'm doing with my kids. All right. Does any and eye breaks, that's more important too. Any Every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away, couple minutes. If you can set yourself up near a window or natural light, look far away, count birds and trees for a few minutes and then come back at it. 